Thanks, Dr. Brian Jacob, for talking to us again. Dr. Jacob spoke to us before about the International Hernia Collaboration on Facebook, and today has agreed to talk about best practices for primary umbilical hernias. So what should be fixed and who should be observed? Hi, Chris, and thanks for having me on your show again. Uh, it was great the first time, and it's great to be back talking about something I love like hernias. Um, and as you know, as a general surgeon, uh, we all have hernias to fix. Uh, the most common type is going to be that belly button hernia, also known as an umbilical hernia, right? Yep. So we see a lot of them. And really, uh, to the audience watching this, the question is not, okay, you've got a belly button hernia, uh, how are you going to fix it? The question really is, uh, who are you, what are you, and what's your background? Like I lost your audio for a second. What's your there. history? Today's uh -huh. way of dealing with stuff and how we're going to choose to fix these things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there, are there um, some generally accepted principles for um, ones which you wouldn't bother to fix at all based on size or patient comorbidities? So that's great. And what we can do is we can sort of go through the algorithm as we mm -hmm. discuss here uh, about what to do. So again, first things first, how old are you? How heavy are you? Do you smoke? What's your surgical history? If you're a female and you're uh, in the pregnancy years, are you going to get pregnant again? Are you athletic or not? Do you take any medications? We need all this information before we can discuss one bit of whether or not to fix it. I'll give you an example. I had a lady come in today and the history was belly button hernia. Okay? No chart, nothing. And when I saw her, she had a healed scar that went from her belly button down to her pubic bone. And I said, so what's that from? She said, oh, I had my uterus taken out. But then I also had five hernia surgeries beforehand. I said, you did? So then it turns out that this lady who also had a lot of, she was heavy, so she had obesity and she smoked, who had five surgeries, was nowhere near ready to have a decision made about how to fix it. Because we first had to obtain old operative reports, we had to get imaging, we had to convince her to lose weight and get off the cigarettes so that she would have an optimal outcome. So we haven't even begun to figure out how we're going to fix hers. So just coming back to it, are there a number of ways to do it? Yes. Are there patients who we choose not to operate on right away? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let's just take one example, uh, a skinny uh, young female, let's say aged 20 to 50, with a small hernia, so a, a small being two centimeters or left, or, or tw a quarter, size of a quarter or less, who has no symptoms from that hernia at all. They're there because the doctor said, come see Dr. Jacob, you got a hernia. I don't have to fix that hernia. If that patient's happy with the way it looks and it's not causing any pain, those hernias can be safely watched. There's a caveat in that the patient has to be educated about three important things. Reducibility, incarceration, and strangulation. So they have to understand that concept. And if they understand the concept, they can be safely watched. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Sounds good. Um... I would say, historically, you know, the way I was trained was just about every hernia they saw was fixed, you know. Um, right. And later, the evidence coming from probably those um, VA studies, you know, just sort of extrapolating from the inguinal hernia studies. But I don't remember any resource ever on umbilical hernias specifically. It's and the it, most debated topic out there. Mm -hmm. You put five surgeons on a panel and ask them mm -hmm. the same question, you're going to get five different ways of fixing it. No wonder the mm -hmm. patients are confused. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of different ways of doing it. Right. So, you know, so yeah, I, I actually will not operate on a variety of different hernias. But mm -hmm. most commonly, the ones I don't operate on are the ones that don't bother the patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are there, are there ones that you'll fix? You know, the, the one that... The, the ones that we worry about coming into our practice are the, the cirrhotics who've got, um, uh, you know, a, a bulge that you can, you know, feel squ uh, water squishing around in and you're starting to see some erosion of the skin um, yes. Yes. Uh, in, in front of their belly button. Tough scenario because mm -hmm. 
you know, when you got a cirrhotic patient, uh, they don't heal well, they have a high incidence of bleeding, and they have a high incidence of infection, so people are very reluctant to use mesh. Uh, you know, there are certain anecdotal surgeons who think it's okay. The majority probably say don't. Uh, the majority will probably wait for that to become an emergency before they take it and, and fix it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so those are very unique populations. Yep. yep. How about a young, healthy, active patient with a two centimeter hernia who is symptomatic? How do you yes. typically approach that? Yeah. So again, if you're out there and you're you're young, healthy, uh, but you you've got an umbilical or a belly button hernia and it bothers you uh, either because of the way it looks or there's occasional pain or you're trying to work out and you just feel it, uh, an operation may be indicated for you. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, Chris, that there's one right answer on how to fix this. It's going to fall back into the experience of the surgeon and the risk, benefit, and side effect profile that you discuss with your patient. So we got three main ways of fixing a hernia. You have an open incision where you primarily close the fascia together. You've got an open incision where you put in a mesh underlay. And then you've got a laparoscopic repair, you know, with or without closing that defect. Mm -hmm. They all have different recovery times, uh, side effects, and it's really what the surgeon's comfortable doing on that particular patient. Mm -hmm. And it just varies. So some people come in and they say, why not just fix them all with a few sutures and don't put mesh in me. I don't want mesh in me. You know, there's all this stuff out there about mesh, you know, and, and it's scaring people. Sure. And unfortunately, it's carrying over into the umbilical hernia world where we know that it's safe mm -hmm. and we do have good outcomes but the patients still have a right to understand your opinion about it. So we t what I tell people is we can fix this primarily with suture, but you're gonna have probably over the course of the next five or 10 years, a 45% and sounds high, but this is what I quote, a 45% recurrence rate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without the use of a prosthetic. Why do I say that? Not because I have a 45% recurrence rate, but because the literature supports a high recurrence rate without the use of mesh. Yeah. If they say, okay, I don't mind taking that chance, well, that's probably the way to fix that small hernia. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if they want to decrease the chance of a recurrence, then you're going to add mesh. And you can add mesh using the open technique or a laparoscopic technique, depending on what you're used to. Mm -hmm. How about uh, are there things about the patient's body habitus that uh, make you choose between an open or laparoscopic repair? I'm glad you asked, because absolutely. <laughs> um, and I don't know if anyone watching this is obese or, or considers themselves fat or heavy, but if you are, I really think that an open umbilical hernia repair should be off the table for you. And I say that for two reasons. Number one, infection, and number two, recurrence rates. If you take a morbidly obese patient and do an open umbilical hernia repair on them, odds are that's recurring no matter what. So you've got two choices. One, help them lose weight which as you know is not easy to do, or two, fix it with a technique that has mesh that can get the widest overlap with possibly even closing that defect, and that's laparoscopy. Mm -hmm. And how do you make that choice about whether or not to close a defect? Another good question. I, for me, it's a, a small defect that's a dime size or, or smaller, I don't close. I don't see the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. Anything bigger than that, I close. Mm -hmm. And so, so bridging over a small defect without a... Uh, I don't see an issue with that at all. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. about, uh, about the tendency to form seromas in front of the mesh? Uh, very rare in the umbilical hernia world. Um, it depends on the size of the hernia. Mm -hmm. So when I do laparoscopy for that small one centimeter defect, which is not often, uh, you know, a seroma is a seroma. It'll form some fluid. It'll disappear on its own. So I tell mm -hmm. patients ahead of time, if they feel a little ball where that hernia used to be, don't get nervous. The hernia didn't recur. It's most likely going to be a ball of fluid, and that fluid will usually absorb on its own if you just leave it alone, and they usually do. You know, Chris, some people have a lot of excess skin from those belly button hernias that have been sitting around for a long time. So the question really is, what do you do with that excess skin? Can you obliterate that space? So I will oftentimes tack that down to try to create an any belly button for people, mm -hmm. uh, almost like an umbilical plasty, if you would. If the skin is thinned out or really red or even turning violaceous where you think it's ulcerated, yeah. I'll excise it. 
Sure. A little mm -hmm. excise and just create a new value button for people. Mm -hmm. In those situations, I would close the defect. Mm -hmm. Do you r remove the SAC if you're doing it laparoscopically? In yes. An umbilical? Mm -hmm. Yes, always. Okay. So if we're going to focus on uh, laparoscopy and the technique for two seconds, mm -hmm. uh, again, if you took five laparoscopic surgeons and watched them do a small or even a medium-sized belly button hernia repair, you'd see five different techniques and you'd have to choose for yourself what you think is better. Mm -hmm. Initially, we were putting the laparoscope in and slapping a piece of mesh up against the abdominal wall on top of fat, on top of the uh, uh, falsiform ligament, on top of the median umbilical ligaments, and that was and calling it a day. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't done it that way in 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do is we take a harmonic scalpel, we excise the falsiform ligament, we excise the incarcerated fat and the preperitoneal fat, all the way down to uh, a place that allows the mesh to sit against the abdominal wall, not fat. Mm -hmm. I actually remove all that adipose tissue, and sometimes I even need an endocatch bag because there's so much of it. Mm -hmm. I don't even leave that in the abdomen anymore. I get it out. If there was incarcerated omentum, sometimes I excise that. Mm -hmm. I then close the defect, and then I put my mesh up on the abdominal wall. So I sort of uh, so emphasize the importance of having that mesh uh, able to integrate with the abdominal wall? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, I am. I don't know if I'm rare or I'm... Um, in the majority, but I really believe that certain types of materials are better designed for incorporation and tissue ingrowth from the abdominal wall. Mm -hmm. I did a study uh, back in 2000, and it was published in 2005, I believe, where we, uh, in an animal, took three different mesh products and did a laparoscopic repair, and then we used a tensometer to pull them off the abdominal wall at 30 days. And what that allows you to do is measure the peel strength of the mesh. Mm -hmm. Now, if, it, it's just logical that if you have at the same time point a, a, a more intense ingrowth into your mesh, that mesh may be better and may have a chance of less recurrence and shrinkage. Mm -hmm. And so I chose to go ahead with a product that has that high tissue ingrowth potential. But to get that tissue ingrowth, it has to be against viable tissue. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I take down the, the, the fat and that's why I close the defect because by closing the defect, you increase the surface area of the mesh that's interacting with the abdominal wall. Mm -hmm. And do you use some trans abdominal wall sutures as well? I do. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what else about uh, umbilical hernias? Tips, tricks? Yeah. You know, again, you got to talk to the patient. The, the mm -hmm. best way to fix an umbilical hernia is what, are you, what is the patient's goal? So I always say to them, you know, what do you want a month from now after this thing is fixed? Do you want a flatter abdomen? Do you want an any because you have an Audi? Do you just are you afraid of of a complication like a strangulation? And and these are, will help. Are you running a triathlon? Yeah, these will help patients figure out. Uh, will actually help the doctor figure out the best way mm -hmm. to, to repair these things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, find out if they have a fear about mesh or if they have no information at all. Mm -hmm. You know, some people with a severe fear of mesh. You know, they'll accept a recurrence. And people will say, well, yeah. you know, recurrence is a horrible complication. It's not. It's a known complication. Hernias do come back. It's not that something was done wrong, especially if it's discussed ahead of time and patients themselves don't want the mesh put in. Mm -hmm. You can do an open repair. So there's definitely, and this is what I want to emphasize about this entire diet, there's not one right way to fix this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Belly button hernias don't have a standard one-time only repair. There's a lot of ways that work. And surgeons who do thousands of, of, what, of the same way every single career, and we got to listen to them. Yeah, yeah. And what do you tell patients about the, their activity limitations after surgery? And does that differ between primaries and laparoscopics? And, or, um, I, now, you know, my patients are allowed to resume full and unrestricted activity when it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. This is how I do it. So, you know, the first week or two are obviously very painful. And I don't, I don't downplay it. I mean, especially with the laparoscopy, I think this is one of the most painful operations that we do. But I tell them, you're going to be unhappy with pain for the first seven to 10 days. You don't want to do any extraneous activity during that period of time. But once the cuts on the outside are healed, once the pain is gone, what that usually represents, and this is just my opinion, is that the intense tissue ingrowth that happens during the first two to three weeks is reaching that you know, maturation phase of wound healing. So you no longer have an inflammatory peritonitis type of pain. 
you now have mature collagen. All the collagen's produced. The ingrowth is just going to mature at that stage. So usually it's around the third week that I tell them that they can go for the full and unrestricted activity. Excellent. Yeah, I always felt that those uh, the, the standard recommendations from history seemed awfully arbitrary, especially when I, I did see some studies about the sort of pressure that people would generate just from a cough or a jump versus a uh, bench press. And, you know, and, and it, uh, it's, it really shows that, the, uh, that, that nobody really knows what is uh, putting a lot of pressure on that abdominal wall and, and when people walk out the door. And, no, uh, we really don't. You know, the, the worst hernia is the one that comes back, right? A recurrence. But that's true only if that's your number one goal. To me, my ma- main metric is, is pain. I really want my patients to have an abdominal wall repair and then get back to their normal life with, with no chronic pain. Mm-hmm. Okay, if that's my number one goal, then my number two goal would be minimize recurrences, but I'm human. So are you. Some of them are going to recur. Yep. Uh, yep. The more important thing is if you see a recurrent hernia, it's not because the surgeon did a bad job. <laughs> You're not going to do a better job. What's important is that you do something different. Mm-hmm. So if they did a laparoscopic repair and it recurred, don't do the same repair. <laughs> right. You're not better than that first guy. <laughs> you know, right. you got to do something different. So you got to you got to look at the op report. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Excellent. Well, thanks for talking to us again. I hope we can talk another day on uh, another topic. I love it, Chris. Thanks a lot. You have a great show and congratulations on all the success on, on your website. Thanks. Appreciate it. Talk soon. Thanks. Thanks for checking out the Op Report. Help us keep conversations alive on topics in general surgery. Check out more episodes of the Op Report and other on surge content here at YouTube. Find us at Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. And find our homepage at onsurge.com. Join the conversation and tell us what topics you'd like to hear about and what people you'd like to hear from.